everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as I, as uh, Becky said, I'm Sarah Dallas, Director of the Southern Adirondack Library System and Palisdo member. Um, I want to share a little bit about Malcolm Hill. Malcolm was a visionary public library system director who believed at the NILA annual, annual conference there needed to be at least one non-library management professional program. This year, I'd like to welcome L.B. Hannes of Tangible Development, who is a senior strategist uh, to present the program. Um, and without further ado, L.B. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Becky. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. I hope everyone's able to enjoy the day before the, the weekend. Glad to be spending the next hour with you. Um, some caveats, you'll notice that my title slide is different than what Becky uh, you know, announced. Uh, in full disclosure, I purposely waited to uh, put this slide together based on the outcome of the election because I didn't want to create something that uh, I couldn't uh, really get my energy behind. And I wanted to make sure that you know, what we talked about today was as relevant as possible to the current political times. And so uh, what the title that I've shifted to today is thinking about is equity, diversity, and inclusion enough. And uh, we're going to talk through um, how to move uh, our EDI efforts organizationally. But before we jump in, uh, I'm going to introduce, uh, talk a little bit more about me for some context setting so you know about who I am and, and what kind of qualifies me to have this conversation today. Uh, I grew up here in, in upstate New York in Johnstown, which is in Fulton County. It's a, a, a small rural county outside of Albany, New York. Um, I'm from a, a large family. I uh, went off to college. I actually initially went off to Hobart William Smith Colleges out in the western part of the state, but uh, did not have a, uh, a good experience. I kind of floundered as a student and I decided to come home and go to SUNY Schenectady where I thought I wanted to become a music teacher. So I had a great experience at SUNY Schenectady at community college and transferred to Syracuse University, that big Hogwarts looking building. If you're not familiar with Syracuse's campus, uh, that's a music building, that's a music school. It's big and beautiful and totally ill-equipped to be a school of music, um, but it looks pretty. And so um, I went to Syracuse, thought I wanted to be a music teacher, finished my music ed degree and got into the classroom and found out very quickly that as a trans and uh, a queer person that K through 12 education wasn't a, a safe place for me. I didn't feel like I could be the best educator that I wanted to be. So I shifted pretty quickly into higher education, stayed at Syracuse, got my master's in higher ed, working with students and student affairs, working at an LGBT resource center, teaching in the classroom. And then I flew south. I'd had enough of the snow and flew south to Gainesville, Florida, which is where the University of Florida is. And I spent almost 10 years there uh, as a higher education professional in a couple different capacities as a diversity practitioner. So I ran the LGBT office. I worked in a, in a general diversity office. I taught in the classroom. Uh, at the undergraduate and graduate level. I taught in the community. So I've taught, I've taught diversity, equity, inclusion to midwives um, and uh, worked, on, worked on and recently completed my PhD. That's my, me, and my, me and my advisor, Dr. Kelly Peck Par Parrott, uh, not social distancing because this was right before the pandemic this year as I finished my, and defended my dissertation. Um, my last three years at the University of Florida and in higher education, I shifted away from diversity services and into executive administration, uh, working directly under a vice president of student affairs. And I really found um, my sweet spot, uh, both professionally and uh, from my research and scholarship, as a connector between folks on the front lines, the, the educators, the service providers, students, community members of marginalized backgrounds and underrepresented people, uh, and the decision makers at the top of the, of the organization. In this case, uh, my experience was in, was in education. And I found that the two camps thought about, experienced, talked about, made decisions around diversity, equity, inclusion very differently. Folks that experienced the issues on the front lines talked about the issues way differently than the folks at the top making the decisions. And I found that I could speak the language of both and could be a bridge builder and connector. And so that led me to my scholarship, which I actually studied uh, a diversity policy, a SUNY diversity policy, looking at uh, the 2015 diversity, equity, and inclusion policy at a SUNY that mandated that every single campus in the SUNY system uh, have a strategic diversity policy and hire a chief diversity officer. 
So I really have a passion for organizational change and taking an organizational change approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion in organizations, regardless of type. Uh, and with tangible development, as, I, as I've shifted over to a consultant role, we do work across all types of institutions, uh, city governments, uh, the corporate sector, healthcare, nonprofit sector, uh, public sector. Uh, we work with organizations that have seven staff all the way up to organizations that have 1600 staff. Uh, and really the approach and the thinking is very similar to organizational change for historically, we've spent a lot of time and effort training our frontline staff and not as much effort at the top. And so uh, that's, that's the kind of scholarly and professional background that I bring to y'all. Uh, I also am a parent. So these are my, my two kids. You can tell from the masks and the, and the kind of makeshift masks. Uh, this was early in the pandemic uh, with us um, uh, back in the spring. Uh, these are my two kids, Elliot and Theo, and they are a joy of my life. And um, uh, fortunately for all of us, they are not here in the same space with me today because otherwise uh, I would be playing defense and they'd be on making their, their selves known. <clears throat> I also am involved uh, in terms of advocacy and community organizing. This is some time I've spent uh, in the over the summer when there was some advocacy efforts going on in New York City in response to the killing of George Floyd and the calls for uh, def defunding the police. Uh, and uh, wanted to make, to make sure and, and give you some insight into the kind of approach that we bring and I bring into the work is that there's many ways to make change and there are many people doing good work and each of us have different roles in, in the kind of larger landscape of change. Uh, but, uh, it, and even within organizations, we can take a cue and learn from the ways that activists are organizing on the outside. I wouldn't necessarily identify currently as an activist or a community organizer, but certainly have support and pay attention and connected to that work because there's lots to learn uh, from the folks that are on the outside of organizations putting pressure on the inside. I'll also say that the activists and the community organizers out in the streets are some of the most uh, diverse cross sections of people, not only the ones in New York City, but across the country, the people that have been hitting the streets for months now are young, they're black, they're brown, they're white, they're uh, LGBTQ, they're coming from all different kinds of socioeconomic statuses. And um, you know, we, they have this kind of cross sectional coalition that are advocating for change. <clears throat> and that, you know, it's kind of this intersectional approach to supporting Black Lives Matters, Black Trans Lives Matters, and we'll go a little bit deeper into this in a minute. And uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to my partner who she made the cover of New York Times. That's her right there in the red hat, protesting for count every vote this, this week, uh, very much being mindful of how much the election is weighing on all of us right now. Um, and I'm sure part of this will come into the conversation today. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a background in terms of the evolution of diversity work. And before I jump in, into some more meat of the conversation, um, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A in the chat function at any point. Um, and Becky, you're empowered to interrupt me and say, hey, there's a really great question or someone needs clarity from the slide before. Um, I grew up in the, no in the North. I moved to the South and learned that I talk very quickly. Uh, that is very clear. Um, and I'm also fighting a sinus infection. So if something isn't coming across very clearly and you need some clarification, please interrupt me and, um, and jump in. And Becky, if there's a great question, please don't wait till the end. But there will be time at the end to ask some, some uh, questions as well. You got it. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the evolution of diversity work. Um, and, and, and this is important, I think, in terms of our context setting and thinking about where we are as a country. I think we have an opportunity uh, given the, the week that we're in to really think big picture historically, contemporarily, and into the future around what we what our country has looked like and what we want it to look like in the future. And you'll see uh, I put a, a, a strong word called inequality regimes in organizational practice, and I'll give you a little bit of insight about what I mean by inequality regimes. But we are kind of at this critical juncture, right? We're, we're managing multiple um, pandemics at the same time. We're talking about the three Ps, the pandemic, obviously the, the COVID crisis is a big one. The protests that have been um, uh, around the country and to, uh, have created this heightened state of emotions in public discourse. Still very much to the moment, I just turned my TV off like 20 minutes before we started so I can get kind of in the right headspace. We're all, we're all still kind of on the edge of our seats waiting to see what will happen. 
And then the politics, both the partisan politics, but the ways in which uh, a lot of the policies and practices and things going on in our world have been politicized. Um, everything has been politicized, right? Mass have been politicized. Um, our work uh, from the federal level has been, has been politicized. Uh, I, we have clients that we've been working with for, for months who have had to you know, slow down a project because of the executive order uh, deeming the work that we do as um, a threat to um, you know, patriotism. And so there's this kind of perfect storm that is impacting how and when we do diversity, equity, inclusion work uh, in organizations. And uh, this is important to kind of take into context. We can't, we can't pretend like all of this isn't weighing heavily on the work that we do. And it sometimes feels like this. This, this was actually my uh, Halloween costume this year. I didn't, I should maybe have put the picture of me as the dog, this is fine dog. Um, but at any given moment, and certainly this week, it probably felt to some of us that this is what, this is what it feels like at any given moment. And certainly 2020, this is what I feel like I felt like all, all year. But, uh, but all of these things have, have historical connections, right? So I'm going to walk you through this trajectory of diversity work just to give you some insight. Um, like I said, I, I'm an organizational change scholar and, and take an organizational change approach to, to this work. So I kind of nerd out when it comes to how organizations respond to external social political context. I'm looking at how organizations um, uh, implement or don't implement policy in practice, um, how they respond to the specific kind of cultural or identity politics that are happening. And so uh, I wanted to give you all a, a, a little insight into thinking about the evolution of organizational change work as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, because I feel like much of what's been missing about how we think about organizational change and how we do diversity work in libraries, in or informal organizations, sometimes it's disconnected from the social political context. So if, I'm gonna go through this quickly just to give you some insight. Let's, let's go back to the mid 20th century around the late 50s, 60s and 70s. Externally, you know, a lot has been, um, of, of this time has been compared to that time. There's similarities, but there's also differences, right? So the external political context of that time, we saw anti-discrimination laws come out of that time, equal opportunity laws came out of that time, affirmative action was born. The modern civil rights and women's rights movements, don't forget the LGBTQ rights movement was born formally out of 69, but certainly was building up to 1969 and through the 50s. Um, the modern uh, disability rights movement and the ADA, movement around ADA was, was born out of this time. Conversations around educational access also came from the 60s and 70s. Really, Brown versus Board of Education was just in the late 50s. So all of that was kind of swirling around us uh, socially and politically in the 60s and 70s. Organizations were responding to the external context by creating women in management interest groups. They were, they were creating things called status of minorities committees and thinking about how do we internally respond to the external environment. When we shift to the 80s and 90s, we see conversations about, about workforce projections to the 2000s, a, 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 a backlash and a response to affirmative action. Uh, political and economic conservatism was born, uh, you know, really got its legs and got a stronghold uh, coming out of the Reagan administration. Uh, and we started to have conversations that are quote unquote beyond race and gender. And so organizationally, we see organizations responding and saying, creating gender and diversity in organization groups. Typically, these groups were comprised of the few people of color in the organizations, the women in the organizations that are coming together uh, around shared uh, identity and shared, and shared passion around seeing some change. Usually they were small in numbers, not necessarily uh, empowered to make organizational change. If you move to the 2000s and 2010s, we have uh, inv individualism, uh, mostly from the uh, technology boom and social media. So everybody has a MySpace account. Everybody has a, a social media account. And the, the birth of Facebook and kind of the, the individualized platforms of, uh, uh, starts to take, take stronghold. Uh, we have uh, post-racialism as a myth that starts to get picked up, particularly with the election of President Barack Obama this myth that we are somehow post a post-racial society. We know the last four years of this administration has killed that myth. Um, and so, uh, which is a good thing because it was a myth, uh, but that, you know, there was this kind of myth going around that we were beyond race. And environmentalism, 
um, expanded beyond the Sierra Club, is expanded beyond um, just kind of the, the kind of like Greenpeace mentality and the connections between race and class and environmentalism started to take root. In organizations, we see conversations around inclusion, spirituality and humanism. And really this is when implicit bias trainings became the kind of rock star go-to organizational response to diversity, equity, inclusion. I it, Virtually, I, I can't see many of you, but I would ask you all to raise your hands for how many folks have sat through an implicit bias training over the last 20 years. I would probably put all the money I have that it's le at least 80% of you. And so we, implicit bias has really been the go-to kind of response for a long time. And it's not to say that implicit bias trainings aren't important and helpful uh, and that they, they do some good, but implicit bias trainings typically take a very individualistic approach to change. And we know that we've been doing implicit bias trainings for almost 15, 20 years now, and we haven't seen the systemic change that we've needed to. So let's, uh, I'm gonna get off my nerd box in a minute, but right now let's talk about the future. We've seen a resurgence of populism, resurgence of white supremacy, overt white supremacy, right? This didn't come out of nowhere, it's always been there. A resurgence of explicit nationalism. Uh, and in response to that, we've seen the Me Too, Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen um, uh, numbers and support for the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement and this uh, rejection of the populism uh, also grow as well. And in organizations, we all are at this kind of critical juncture to figure out how do we actually make change? Uh, everyone's really trying to figure out what does the investment look like? How do we, how do we make some systemic organizational change? And uh, no, what we have been doing is not necessarily moving the needle in, in the ways that we need to. And so we're really at this critical juncture. I think what the election has done for us is it's, give, it's been another stark reminder given how close the election is of the deep kind of in, embedded problems in the United States. And now it's our, our time to kind of get to work. And I think no other kind of uh, quotes speak to the realities uh, as, as, you know, as Dr. Dr. Ibn Kendi's quote here from his, he, he's had a couple of books that have been talked about recently in the, in the United States. Um, how to be an anti-racist is one of the more current ones, but he also wrote a book in 2017 called Stamped from the Beginning where he, he's a historian. So he, he documented pretty meticulously the, the origins of racist policies and laws and racism in the United States. And, and, and he presents the argument, which I think I agree with, is that you know there's, there's been this conversation about racial progress in the United States. Um, and he says that racial progress has always been outpaced and, and, and matched with racist progress. progress. And while we will, we will be on a march of racial progress, racist progress will always try to outpace it and, and work against it. And you know the the backlash to affirmative action is an example of that. Uh, the election of uh, Donald Trump four years ago was an example of that. We had uh, eight years with a black president in a pretty progressive you know a, a progressive time period. We saw an immediate rejection of that. And so we need to make sure that we're staying vigilant in our in our in our work and vigilant in our commitment to racial progress. Uh, so that you know the racist progress doesn't uh, continue to take as, up, up as much power and control. And throughout all of this, we need to be reminded by Audre Lorde's quote that there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And so while we talk about racial progress, we talk about anti-racism, um, anti-racism, you can't have racial justice without economic justice, without gender justice, without disability justice. It's all intersectional. And so Audre Lorde's quote is really about intersectionality and intersectionality was born out of black feminism. And so we need to make sure that we're being intersectional in our approach to this work. A couple of the concepts I wanted to kind of lay the foundation for for our conversation today is that we have to see racism as a cancer. We have to see it as a cancer in the bones of the of the kind of systemic way we uh, institutional and cultural bones of the United States. And so, um, Doctor um, uh, Professor Derek Bell, he's a he's a law professor and scholar around critical race theory, talks about uh, interest conver interest convergence theory. And I, and I bring this up today not to get totally on like a scholar nerd box all, all morning or all afternoon, uh, but to put some concepts together and have us start thinking about how our culture is shifting. And so the interest convergence theory is the theory that black people and people of color will only achieve civil, right, civil rights victories only when 
white and black or people of color interests converge. Essentially, white people will only care about the rights of people of color when they also, when we also get something from it. And so when we're thinking about anti-racism and being anti-racist pra practitioners and leaders, we have to think about um, the, the balance between uh, uh, where interest convergence theory is and trying to reject uh, wh white interest convergence theory as much as possible. So I want, to keep, I want us to keep that in mind too as we thought, start thinking about organizational change. But I do believe that racism and many of us, I hope, hopefully many of us are feeling hopeful that racism is a cancer that we can cure, but it is deeply, deep, deeply seated. And so it has to be a long vigilant fight. I don't believe it's a cure in my lifetime. I'm hoping maybe in my children's lifetime or their children's lifetime, but we all have a responsibility to, to, to work uh, towards uh, eradicating it in our daily in our daily lives, both personally and professionally. I'm going to stop here for a second and take a sip of water and see if there's any questions that came in uh, while I was uh, pontificating. Becky, anything come through? Uh, yeah, um, let's see. Um... Oh, someone was curious. They say that they missed um, what your pronouns are. Sure. Uh, thanks for asking. Any pronouns work for me. Yep. And other than that, I don't know if anyone has a quick question they want to pop in the chat or I will also interrupt again if need be. All right. That's plenty of time for me to take a drink of water and coffee. So I mentioned earlier on this notion of inequality regimes. Um, and so this is uh, from some of the scholarship that uh, I, I worked on. Um, this isn't from me, but a, a scholar that I used in my dissertation talked about inequality regimes because I'm starting to, to transition us from kind of the theoretical and the cultural and social political into the organizational ways that inequality is built into the structure of how we do things. Even the most forward-thinking, progressive, committed organization is built on structures of inequality because the ways in which our organizations are created to have legitimacy, you have to in some ways be um, in, uh, unequal uh, and inequitable. And so this is from uh, the scholarship uh, Acker from 2006. Uh, she says, all organizations have inequality regimes defined as loosely interrelated practices, processes, actions, and meanings that result in and maintain class, gender, and racial inequities within particular organizations. The ubiquity of inequality is obvious. Managers, executives, leaders, and department heads have much more power and higher pay than secretaries, production workers, students, or even professors. And so obviously within her context, she's talking about higher education, but this is a kind of across all types of organizations. If inequality exists within your organization, you operate under an inequality regime. And uh, I, I use that word specifically in inequality regime because uh, we have to move away from this notion that organizations are inherently neutral for us to be able to impact any of this work, particularly within libraries, within the, the roles that y'all uh, play in communities and the functions that you have in terms of access to information and the services that you provide uh, within the communities that you serve, working against these inequalities as a profession matters uh, as much as the, as, a, as the accessibility of your services. And so Acker talks about uh, inequality regimes in five different ways. The basis of inequality. So um, in which ways are, is your organization in, in, uh, inequitable in terms of identity? We know that the library profession is predominantly white. And we know that there's inequalities built into organizational hierarchies. The shape and degree of inequality. So the more bureaucratic your organization is, the more hierarchy there is, the more unequal it's going to be. Um, organizational processes that produce inequalities. So things like performance evaluations, pay structures, um, pay caps, things like that. Um, su supervisory and managerial relationships that are um, actively working on reducing power inequities. All of these things reproduce and support inequality. The visibility and in inequality and legitimacy of inequalities. And so if, if an inequality is allowed to exist, uh, then that, that's supporting your, your organizational being, organization being inequitable. So for example, if you have a facility that is not accessible for people with disabilities, the fact that that, that um, inequality is uh, permissible and is allowed 
uh, supports the organization being inequitable. Um, the, the reality of having uh, bathrooms that are not gender neutral uh, and that are not safe for, pe for trans people to, uh, to use uh, is, a, is the visibility and the existence of an inequality that is allowed to exist and is legitimized through the organization. And then control and compliance. What are the ways in which control and compliance are used uh, within the organization? Uh, and many of the ways that we use control and compliance uh, are, are inequitable. And so these are just kind of the ways in which inequity shows up within organizations. And we have to work kind of actively against them to make sure that we're not reproducing inequalities within our organization. So I'm gonna move a little bit closer to, to what tangible steps for change would look like. And I really want us to think about if racism and inequality is a cancer, we have to take a very meticulous kind of like treatment-like approach uh, and, and sometimes my, in the minutia to organizational change. I think one of the, one of the, um, the problems with diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we see this in the literature a lot, is that people get caught up in terms of uh, diversity talk as, as feel good. You know, they wanna, they wanna the, 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 the food and the fun, the, the, um, the celebrating cultures, the uh, celebrating, you know, uh, differences, the feel good parts of diversity uh, can be pretty damaging because really for organizational change to happen, we have to get to the hard stuff. We have to get to the unpopular things. We have to get to the uh, riskier things for organizational change to, to happen. And so I really want us to think about um, you, you treating, uh, treating it as a disease. And we have to think very strategically as doctors do about how to localize, how to put a lot of effort into uh, uh, attacking a problem. And it can be uncomfortable. It's not always pleasant, uh, but that's what we need to do to actually make some organizational change. And in order to do that, you have to have a common language. I'll show you a, a close, my closing slide has kind of Dr. Kendi has uh, this, you know, pretty uh, graphic that he has in some of his literature that shows some steps. And I want to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page around common language, because, you know, how I talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice or anti-racism might be different. And being on the, speaking the same language is, is important in, in one of the first steps. So this is from a scholar, D.L. Stewart. They say diversity asks who's in the room. Equity responds who's trying to get in the room but can't. And inclusion asks, has everyone's ideas been heard? Diversity asks, how many more of underrepresented identity group do we have this year than last? Equity responds, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as a majority here? And inclusion asks, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong? So when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about numbers, numbers of different types of people in different groups, representation. Representation is very important. We talk a lot about diversifying uh, our staff, diversifying staff within uh, libraries, diversifying the li library profession, librarian profession. We know that uh, people of color, I work closely with some libraries up here in the capital region, and we know that there's diversity within the organization, but as you get higher up in leadership and management positions, uh, the diversity and the representation of people of color uh, does not track up the organization. And that is true for most organizations and most professions. Um, but, you know, we can think about different kinds of numbers. Uh, think about race and ethnicity, thinking about gender, uh, think about it outside of the binary. How many of our organizations uh, track uh, trans and gender non-binary and gender non-conforming folks? Uh, how many how many organizations track your, your, your caregivers, your parents? That's been a huge uh, impact on that on caregiving and parental populations the pandemic has and, and has significantly affected folks. So veterans, uh, you know, lots of different kinds of, of representation and, 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 and people. Equity is the work to fo that focuses on policy and practice and where there are barriers for some groups over others. And inclusion is the work to make sure everyone feels like they belong. So this is the celebrating Black History Month, Women's History Month, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, Pride Month, the celebrations, but is but inclusion is the work uh, around how you manage conflict in an organization. How, uh, how do you how do you practice accountability within an organization? How do you um, how do you work through uh, problems long term? Uh, belonging is more than just the feel good part of this work. And then the fourth word I'll add here is social justice or justice work that focuses on systemic or transformative change at the root of the problem and attempts to right historical wrongs. So a couple of examples of this, and then we're gonna go a little bit deeper. 
um, thinking about um, uh, Georgetown University a couple of years ago publicly declared that, you know, acknowledged that they used enslaved labor to build their uh, to build their campus buildings, which is pretty common for higher education institutions. Um, and so they public acknowledged it and then created a reparations fund for descendants of enslaved people to go to Georgetown for free. Um, and also one of my favorite social justice kind of narratives out in the mainstream is uh, Frozen 2. If you've seen Frozen 2 as many times as I have, you know what I'm talking about. The protagonists write a historical wrong that their, their grandfather had done to the indigenous people at risk to their livelihood. And so justice work is very much part of the mainstream now and something that we have to be talking about. That's why I labeled this lecture, uh, is equity, diversity, inclusion enough? And really uh, pushing us to think about social justice practices. And for me, social justice uh, equals anti-racist, anti-racism equals social justice. You can't necessarily do uh, social justice work without also being anti-racist. And so we can get into the semantics of this, but for me, when I talk about social justice, I talk about anti-racism. For me, they are one and the same. And how can we start thinking away from equity, diversity, inclusion into justice, uh, into justice work more formally as, as an organization? Because neutrality is no longer an option. We can't necessarily, a lot of the work we've been doing with clients is how do we get leadership to think about taking public stances on anti-racism, on, 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 on equity issues. You can't necessarily say that systemic racism is not a real thing. Organizations have to step into that space and acknowledge and say, systemic racism is a real thing and this is what we're gonna do to, to, to make a difference and, and change our organizational culture. So this is a chart from the National Juvenile Justice Network that for me, I love. While it is kind of one dimensional in terms of the way it looks, it is pretty dynamic in clearly spelling out the differences and the trajectory on multiple kind of criteria, what it means to move from an all white club to a, a token or affirmative action style organization to a multicultural organization and then ultimately to an anti-racist organization. And I want us to focus on not necessarily the first two uh, columns, the all white club or the token or affirmative action, but the difference between a multicultural organization and an anti-racist organization. I know, you know from my experience with working li with li libraries and librarians in higher education, and um, I, started, I helped start a LGBT youth group in, in Gainesville, Florida, and our partner in that work was the library. They were our, our main partner. They, they were the first ones to step up to the table and say, you know, we'll host you, we'll be a, co we'll be a, a partner in this work. And so I know that libraries have historically had, a, had a, 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 a strong role in equity, diversity, inclusion, whether uh, in higher education or in communities. So I really wanna focus us on the, how you shift from a multicultural organizational thinking to an anti-racist or justice organization in some of these criteria, right? Decision-making, budget, money from, accountable to. And really the, the main difference between the two is a couple of different scenarios. Uh, the role in the ways in which people of color are engaged in the organization and how power is, is, is treated and controlled. And so in an anti-racist organization, decision-making is made by a diverse group across all sectors. People of color are in significant leadership positions and everyone understands how power is distributed and how decisions are made. There's transparency, there's communication, and power is something that you're talk, you talk about often and, and that uh, people can engage in and call those in power, uh, uh, call, them, call them into the conversation as well. When it comes to money in an anti-racist organization, it's developed, controlled, and understood by people of color and white people at all levels of organization. In a multicultural organization, and, you, and usually our, you know, an organizational model would be you have a CFO or you have a budget person that the budget is developed, controlled, and understood by one or two often, often white people. Uh, and that decisions about money is not widely known across the organization. When we think about money from, uh, in a multicultural organization, it usually comes from philanthropic organizations, foundations, the wealthier middle class, and it's treated as like a, as a, as a, a charity, right? It's supporting people of color is seen as charity rather than you know, talking about the redistribution of resources community-wide. Uh, who anti-racist organizations accountable to uh, is a main difference, right? So in a multicultural organization, 
uh, multicultural organizations, uh, they are accountable to their funders, to their board and the staff. And there might be some, some token attempts to, to be accountable to those targeted by the mission. But usually it's about who pays the bills, who's giving you money. That's who you're thinking about when you think about risk and who you're accountable to. In an anti-racist organization, you're accountable to the communities that are targeted in the mission, who you, who you serve. Uh, so then you'll see a couple different columns here, power and pay, locate and you know uh, where they're located and who the members of the organizations are. I'm going to talk a little bit more about power and pay and then move us through some steps to what uh, leaderships can do and, and talk a little bit more specifically about how to translate this into the, into the libraries and then open up some time for, for question and answer at the end. But this power and pay row is really important. If we think about the difference between a multicultural organization and an anti-racist one, an anti-racist organization has people of color in decision-making position that pay a decent wage comparable to the wages of white people, and by decent meaning equal, if not more, right? So if we think about what affirmative action actually is, is if you have two, two candidates, one white, one person of color, and they have equal uh, qualifications, the person of color is given in the advantage because they are a person of color, right? Be because that is seen as something that is an advantage to the organization. Um, and, and more and more folks kind of kind of wrap their head around the, that, that kind of work and, and seeing that as a valid form of credentialing and, and contribution that people of color can bring to the organization. Uh, in an anti-racist organization, administrative and service positions are perceived as stepping stones to positions of, of more power and more pay. And there's training and mentorship often, often provided and thinking about equity as much as possible in, in terms of pay and, and power and decision making. And y'all will get, you know, these resources. And like I said, the National Juvenile Justice Network, this is on their website. It's, it's readily available. I, we didn't create it. So you're welcome to, 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 to look it up and, and, and peruse it and, and, and live, in, live by it uh, after, after today as well. And then, you know, there's some other columns here around culture uh, and programs. Um, if we think about culture, we think about really going back to this notion of uh, a power analysis about racism and other oppressive issues. Power is often talked about and engaged with, uh, and, and conflict is something that is uh, that you navigate and negotiate organization wide. So again, I'm going to share these with you, but I'm going to move to some some tangible steps. Um, I'm going to. This is just a maturity model, but uh, I'll share it. I want to move a little bit faster because I spent a little bit too much time in the beginning and move us to some tangible steps about how to be both a, an anti-racist leader at the individual level and then at the organizational level, because you know, if you can't tell from now, really pushing people to think beyond equity, diversity, inclusion, and really start thinking about how we nudge our organizations to be more justice forward, thinking more about justice, more about redistribution of resources and power. Um, you know, the first step around being an individual, uh, at the individual level, being an anti-racist leader is engaging in vigilant self-awareness, thinking about how your identity provides or prevents access to necessary resources. How does your power and privilege show up in your work? Uh, what kind of single narratives are you telling yourself about colleagues uh, and how that affects decisions, performance management, and other interactions? And then what kind of materials do you use that uplifts uh, whiteness or, or lifts up the experiences and voices of people of color and actively doing that on a regular basis? Other steps are acknowledging racism and the ideology of white supremacy. Uh, I think as white people, we shy away from talking about white supremacy because we've been taught that that's kind of, you know, folks in white hoods. But white supremacy is just kind of the, the, the white privilege in action. It's just white privilege is everywhere and white, that's what white supremacy is. Let's study and use representative history, talking about race and racism with our colleagues and with our boards and our stakeholders. And I think I, a lot of experience is that folks are comfortable talking internally with their organization about race and racism, but when they're tasked with talking externally with their boards, their representatives, their funders, is when folks start to shut down and get or get a little bit nervous and get a little bit shy around uh, holding their values around anti-racism. When you see racism, do something about it, little or big, and, and shape an anti-racist future. And this is from um, Dina Simmons from uh, from a, a 2019 update and I can share that resource with you as well. Let's talk about how to do this at the organizational change level. Leadership engagement is step number one. You have to figure out your long-term strategy for sustaining organizational change. And so this is from the literature as well as around how leadership and organizations think about phasing out your approach to 
long-term organizational change. I offer this to you, not to necessarily get in the nitty gritty about this because there's a lot here, but how do you think about building and sustaining change over time? A lot of the, a lot of the um, kind of hiccups that people have run into is that particularly when the, after the killing of George Floyd, a lot of CEOs came out with these strong statements about support for Black Lives Matter without the infrastructure to support it. And they're kind of realizing now months later that they, they don't have the infrastructure in the, someone used the, the metaphor earlier, they, they let the horses out of the barn, but there was no barn for them to come back to. And so how are we thinking about building the, the barn and sustaining the barn long-term once, once the momentum and the, and, the, and the kind of like heat behind change has, has dissipated? There was a recent poll that showed that immediately after the killing of George Floyd, 60% of white Americans supported the Black Lives Matter movement. Months later, the same, the same pollsters asked the same question about white support for Black Lives Matter and it dropped to 45% of white Americans supported Black Lives Matter in a matter of months. So this work has to really support, be structurally built into the work that you do and supported long-term. And so thinking about it from a structural, behavioral and cultural place. Step two would be to identify and acknowledge the problem. Many of you are already in this work from a national organization perspective. I know that you have a history and a, and a long history of doing equity, diversity, inclusion work. How are you bringing that, those issues and thinking about how equity, diversity, and inclusion impacts you at the local level, right? Uh, if you, we talk to a lot of organizations that are predominantly white or we think about libraries that are in predominantly white communities, how do, how do you talk and acknowledge and identify the problem of racism in a predominantly, almost, almost exclusively white uh, community? And how do, we get, how do we get our communities to think about and talk about it? So doing some kind of assessment, um, uh, doing an evaluation internally and externally. And this is just some of the questions that, that we would ask. Um, this is an internal assessment. We would want you to assess your current diversity, equity, and inclusion state by doing climate surveys or leadership readiness surveys, doing SWOT analyses. As you can see, we're getting into like the very kind of technical, tactical approach to change. It can't all be the feel good statements and the, the lunch and learns and the town halls. We have to think very tactically about how you eradicate this problem. And to do that, you need to have a more precise understanding of where your problems are as an organization. And so using tools like this, you know, you know, there are many companies, myself as one, but there are many, uh, there are many companies that do this kind of work. And to think about precisely, let's think about what we are struggling with as an organization at our local level and then design goals and strategies and accountability and metrics around the specific goals that, that we can move as an organization within our local community. And then defining diversity, equity, and inclusion for your organization. You might have a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement on your website. What, is, what does it look like? You have to acknowledge it. Uh, where is it? Is it part of your overall statement? Is it, do you have a separate diversity, equity, and inclusion or justice statement? How explicit is it? Do you talk about anti-racism? Do you talk about social justice? Do you talk about diversity, equity, inclusion? Do you talk about specific populations that experience uh, marginalization? Um, the, there's separate you know, statements, like I said, that diversity, equity, inclusion is not central to your mission, but it's elsewhere. Uh, the integrated ones have your mission and vision uh, weaved in. And explicit or uh, or implied, like I mentioned. So, for example, this is uh, this is uh, Starbucks. They have a separate mission, a diversity, equity, inclusion mission. They talk about it uh, on a separate page, um, but they're. I would say that this is a separate but explicit one because they talk about their partners are not only diverse in gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability. They talk about the identity-based part of this work but they also talk about uh, inclusion, they connect it to their business, their business success. This is one from the United Way of the Capital Region where they have a separate, again, another separate diversity, equity, inclusion statement, but a very explicit one. You can see that they define diversity and inclusion. They talk about their history. They name uh, how differences are usually typically defined uh, at, the, at the identity level. This is an, a, a nonprofit, again, in the capital region that serves uh, LGBT people of color. And this is a, this is a integrated mission and vision that is very explicit. You know, they, they very explicitly talk about the communities that they serve. 
and how they do it and how they serve the underrepresented and marginalized population that they that they have. And then there are other steps, right? We have to do strategy development, implement those goals, do learning and development to support those goals, and then sustain the work. So, um, you know, my goal here is not necessarily to overwhelm you, maybe a little bit, because if we think about the enormity and the historical kind of century old problems that we're trying to fix and eradicate, the approach to change is very big, but we have to kind of think of it in a very tactical, strategic, precise, tangible, step-by-step, -step, um, you know, almost like a, a, a treatment approach to, to remedying a lot of these kind of social and political and cultural problems that we have. And so here's, as promised, that image that I said earlier from, from Dr. Kendi that talks about how we do this work. And you'll see some of the things that we mentioned today that racism is a cancer. We have to scan, diagnose, and surgically remove it. We have to have common language. We have to anchor ourselves in common language and definitions and hold true and be vigilant to that work. We have to uh, meet people where they are, right? So take a developmental approach to this work, but also not be neutral. So what I mean by that is we certainly want to um, not be in a place where we cut people out because they don't know enough or they're not there in their development. But we can't allow people to, to, to say or, or, be, or resist us with the reality that things like systemic racism or homophobia or transphobia or, or you know, gender issues aren't real. There has, to be a, there has to be a new baseline for the organizational uh, commitment to what is, what is real and hold people to that. And then allow people and give people the support to come to, the, to that work and support them in, in moving forward as an organization. So I'm gonna uh, stop us here. I've talked a lot and very quickly in, four, in 46 minutes, and I'm gonna open up the floor for questions, comments, reactions, uh, and happy to have other folks jump in and, and, and share what they've been doing as well. Um, okay, so Genevieve from out uh, in Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. My town is very white and showed itself publicly as quite racist a few years ago. Is this type of change seen at a town, at type of change seen at a town as organization level, there is a revitalization plan in the works that I doubt takes anti-racism into account. Yeah, thanks for that question. Sorry, I took a break to blow my nose. Um, I, I, the question I think was around, um, should we treat the community as the organization? Um, that's, what, that's what the question was, right, Becky? Yes, yeah. Can the same like tools apply? Yeah, I think the same tools can apply for sure. I think it's a little bit harder when you're working with the public and when you're trying to use the, the public as an organization. I think, um, so we work with some city governments and we think very strategically about, we, you know, public entities uh, are organizations themselves that have a commitment to serving the public. And so I think the same strategies can apply, but how, they're, how you do it and how you manage it um, is gonna be a little bit different. I would, I would say, that for libraries um, and library systems is to do as much work internally as you can um, and, 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 and apply these tactics in and do the work internally and then apply it externally because your scope of control is only so much. Right now, what we've all been reminding ourselves in the, in the moments of overwhelm is to you know, manage your scope of control. What can you control? And, and for many, and for libraries, you can't, we can't control the whole public. That requires many entities. The library is one of them. Uh, public officials is another, city government. There's many stakeholders that are involved for managing the community as an organization. But I think if you were to get many of those entities on the same page and, and, create, the, and create the community as an organization, uh, you could apply the same kind of like approaches, um, but it has to be super strategic and well thought through and, and connected, a kind of unified front from all those kind of public entities that support working with the public. Mm. Um, we have another, this, uh, this was fantastic. And then uh, how do we respond to organizations that aspirationally call themselves anti-racist, though they acknowledge that they are quote, not there yet to encourage the motivation for change without misrepresenting the current culture? So how do we keep them going and acknowledge yeah, I would say that most organizations are not anti-racist. So the ones that say that they are, are all working on it. Um, even, even a lot of the kind of social justice activist organizations, uh, anti-racism is a practice, right? There's, it's not a destination. 
and it, and it has to be a vigilant practice. And so ones that articulate that they want to be um, are, 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 that's great. They, we need to make sure that they know what they're, what they're saying they want to be. I, I'm working with several organizations that they say they, they, are, they are or want to be a social justice organization or an anti-racist organization, but aren't necessarily, don't have their heads around what that actually means. And so um, I think it's okay to say that you want to be one and that you're actively working on it and actually do the work of supporting people through it. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, talk around like cancel culture and things like that. And there's a lot of work within, um, you know, uh, within progressive and, and anti-racist and social justice work to push against this notion of cancel, cancel culture because the whole purpose of anti-racism is not more, not more, not to be more punitive. Uh, we need to call people in. We need to be developmental. We need to forgive. We need to work with people. Now, there's there's baselines. There's there's behaviors and intolerance that you can't you can't permit and allow. But as long as people are working on it, let's give them the space and the opportunity to get better while holding them accountable. And so I don't know if I answer this question directly, but I think people need to one know what they're talking, what they're committing to when they say they're anti-racist, which is why I like bringing up the that kind of diagram. Uh, and two, when they say they want to be it, hold them to it and allow them to come back and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. Yeah, hold the space. Um, uh, we have two more questions. For a library just getting started, is it best to invite those interested employees um, to meet regularly with the administration support so that they can begin to form a solid foundation and then move toward an all staff and board education? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you're talking, so pulling together, together committee, I think there's probably been more diversity, equity, inclusion committees created since <laughs> since the spring than there ever has been in the history of the nation. Um, I think bringing people together that want to do the work is good and important and you want to empower that. Um, and there, if I had a dollar for every time a committee of, of passionate people were pulled together without any clear purpose and scope, or any power to make any change, um, then I would have a lot of dollars because that's usually what happens. We pull all the passionate people together, but passion doesn't necessarily mean that they have the the, pra the, the practice. They're doing this work as a is a practice, as a skill, as a profession. People can learn it. You don't have to go to school to learn it. Uh, and many people who have lived experience of marginalized identities know how to do this work by through their lived experience and to some degree. But if you're gonna pull people together and say, I wanna hear from you, actually have the infrastructure to empower them. What's happening in a couple cases is we're pulling people together. The groups are saying, this is the change that we want to see, but the leadership is not ready to change. And so they're saying, yeah, come together, meet, give us ideas, but then the ideas are hitting a wall. That's gonna create frustration. That's gonna create disempowerment. And so when you're pulling groups together, let's make sure we're being clear about purpose, the capacity of that group, and making sure that those folks that are doing more work are compensated for it either in money or in time. And so uh, this work is actual work and we wanna make sure that people that come together, they're usually the marginalized, the people of color, the women, the trans and gender non-conforming folks, the, you know, the people, the folks with disabilities, the folks from underrepresented backgrounds, um, asking them to do more labor on behalf of the organization without compensation is also an inequity. I think we have time for one more. So um, Barbara from, from Syracuse, actually, um, how do we help communities understand the difference between equality and equity? Uh, there's lots of great resources about it uh, on, the, on the internet. So I think, you know, if that's something that you're really struggling with as a community or as an organization, doing some learning around it, um, giving many examples of it. There's lots of great graphics. There's a really great graphic uh, out there that, that has this kind of apple tree. It's like the apple tree graphic. I could try to find it and send it along with the slides that talks about the difference between equality and equality is everybody gets the same thing. Uh, inequity is that everybody gets what they need to uh, access the resources for their livelihood and their survival and their thriving. And so um, I think you could get really creative about uh, uh, learning opportunities for your community about uh, equality versus inequity. I think, and I know most people like that idea in theory until it impacts them in a negative way. And that's why I like to bring up this white, this interest convergence theory because 
for, for, for white people or for men or for cisgender people or straight people. Uh, the, the idea of, in, of if, uh, equity is good in theory until it means that I have to lose something. Now, when it comes to rights, you don't really lose rights. But when it comes to time and money and access and power, those things are finite. And so to give some of those things time, money, access, power to, dec to decision-making tables, giving opportunities for those that have historically been left out means that some of us have to get out of the way. And for some of us, that's a hard pill to swallow. And so I think really ask yourself, are folks not understanding what the difference is or they don't really, really want to, aren't really about equi equity uh, when it's applied. There's a theory and there's the applied. And so how do you get people to do the emotional and rational work of understanding that if we want to see things change, you really have to, some of us have to give up some of the, uh, some of the privileges that we've been historically given. And so I think differentiate between, is it a knowledge, a theoretical thing or an applied thing? And then build, build kind of learning and development and conversations and work around that. And I could, do you mind taking one more? Yeah. Right for me? Right. Okay, great. Um, so within the library system, you are the only person of color in the library system. You would think it would be obvious. How do you work with that? As the only person of color in the library system? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, as a white person, I don't know if I have the best uh, answers for uh, how to survive as a person of color. What I hear from other folks in, in, in similar positions is to one, build a network in a community uh, that, that supports you. Uh, people of color and white allies are accomplices. And I use those things differently. Accomplices are people that will risk, do, that will work on behalf of someone else at great risk to them. Ally is a little bit more of a passive role. So I would say build your, build your networks uh, and build your support systems internally to the organization and externally. Uh, document everything. And um, I think, so I'll, 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 a parallel experience for me that I can speak more directly about because I'm not a person of color is I am often the only trans person in an organization and I have been historically or, or at least in a leadership team um, or at a, you know, at, in a certain group. And for me, I always have to figure out my capacity that day of am I going to be the spokesperson for all trans people today or am I not? And sometimes I don't feel like being the spokesperson for all trans people. And I have to give myself permission for, to not be the spokesperson because it's not my job. Other people have to be thinking about trans people as well, not just me. And so I think, um, think critically about protecting your energy and uh, your capacity and finding your allies and your accomplices and doing what you feel like is good for you and your organization without at, at, at great risk to your mental, emotional, and physical health. And uh, last one, our staff reflect the community. Some of them are racist. Any words of advice? Yeah, uh, obviously there's lots of racist people all around us. Um, we knew that before this week though. Um, that's what I mean in terms of like um, raising the, the, the floor of what an organization's uh, approach to anti-racism is. I think there has to be, uh, you, we have to raise the expectation around what is, what is permissible at work. Now, you're not necessarily going to, as an organization, force someone to not be racist, but you can raise the expectation around uh, what is permissible at work, how people talk, how people um, behave, and be very vocal that the organi organization itself does not uh, believes that systemic racism is real and is working uh, to eradicate it from the organizational level. And I would also say if those people are in positions of power and have decision making, that you are hyper vigilant about their decision making and track, you know, tracking everybody, but track everybody so that you're seeing patterns of decisions across time. And so that, you know, we're, we're building in kind of stopgap measures to people that we know uh, have racist beliefs. And that's what I say for in my short window time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like this session could have been four times, four days as long. Thank you so much, LB, for your time and insights. And again, this will be recorded. And when I, um, I'll have LB send me a PDF of the slides and share them. Um, the chat is now just thank you. Thank you. This was incredible. Blown away. Thank you.
This was great, all caps. Thank you, very insightful. So um, again, thank you so much, LB. And um, there is one last session, everyone. Uh, so if you have another hour in you of content, you can start at 3.30. Um, so again, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks to LB and um, take care. Thanks everyone, good luck, have a good weekend. You too. Bye. Bye.